Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to the first of two classes called Resurrection Apologetics. We're looking at ways to refresh our faith in the resurrection and to be better resourced to talk about the resurrection to our friends who don't yet have faith in it. We see, for example, that the Apostle Paul made the resurrection, at, uh, put it at the core of his teaching about Jesus. In Acts chapter 17, when he's in Athens, a very skeptical and secular place compared to his uh, uh, his Jewish roots, he says this at the end of his sermon, he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. That's what he's saying there. And what's the reaction of the crowd? When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And so when we talk about the resurrection, typically that's what happens. Some sneer, but some say, that's fascinating. I'd like to know more. And our faith level depends on how confidently, confidently we preach and teach it. But whether we're resourced to be able to teach about it, that's also another factor. So these classes are aimed at helping us to have greater faith in the resurrection, but also to be better resourced to teach others. And that's why I've asked Simon Dinning and Rob Payne to do these two classes. And thank you very much for doing them. The first one today is by Simon Dinning. If you don't know him, he's in our sister church in Belfast and has a particular interest in apologetics in general, but certainly in the resurrection in particular. And I love what he's teaching us today in a short 15 minute class on two of his favorite aspects of evidences for the resurrection. So without further ado, I'll let Simon loose on us and then we'll have some questions to think about at the end. Everyone, it's an honor to be able to share these thoughts on the resurrection and specifically evidence for the resurrection. It is an honor. Uh, thanks so much to Malcolm for asking me to do this. To take basically to pick my favorite two, um, see one here, my favorite two pieces of evidence from the resurrection. Um, I've just done a talk on it recently and there was, um, you know, five pieces of evidence. I'm picking my, my favorite two. So my favorite two, the first one that I want to look at is that Jesus' disciples believed he rose and appeared to them. So there's a consensus among scholars, whether they be Christian or atheist New Testament scholars, believe it or not, there's a consensus that the, the disciples believed that they seen Jesus risen from the dead. They claimed it and they also believed it. So that's the two slants to this piece of evidence. First of all, they, they claimed it, but second of all, they believed it. So, and where, how does the evidence support that? Well, they, they did claim it. They claimed that they seen the risen Jesus. Um, we know this from the testimony about Paul. So Paul was an historical character in his own right, um, separate from the writers, the gospel writers. And Paul himself, as an independent source, claimed that they claimed it. He, he said that they claimed this. The disciples claimed to have seen the risen Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, which is the passage we'll, we'll tend to look at quite a lot, actually. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. And it tells us in verse 3 there, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, Paul himself, as the one abnormally born. So Paul's saying he knew them personally. We're going to find out a wee bit more detail about this in a second. But Paul f found out from them personally, this is the, an, an oral creed that was given, um, where he claims that they, they said they seen the risen Christ. He rose after three days. So he, Paul, independent source in 1 Corinthians here, is saying they claimed it. So that's the first thing, and we're going to, the second bit of evidence is really looking at the same scripture, but this is Paul saying he, that they claimed it. The second bit here is really oral traditions. So this little passage we just read there um, is well known as being a New Testament creed. So a creed that was going around orally from the disciples to one another uh, before the New Testament was ever written. The way it is shaped, the way it, is, um, the way it has been written here, shows that it used to be, it was a creed of the early church. So we'll see here that this had existed prior to the writing of the New Testament. It was a popular way to pass on information. I was saying to people recently, I often develop acronyms, which is a way of passing on information. Um, it's a handy way to remember information. Paul wrote this down, 1 Corinthians 15, in 80, around AD 55. But this early creed that he says in 1 Corinthians here would have predated the writings of Paul. 
um, and they received it from Peter and James. So we're going to find out where would Paul have likely received this oral creed that he's written down here in AD 55. Well, Galatians chapter five, chapter one, sorry. Galatians chapter one. And we'll look in there in verse 18. So Galatians 1, verse 18 is where scholars and atheist scholars, including Bart Ehrman, actually believe that this is where Paul picked this up from. And um, verse chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stay with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing is no lie. So he's saying here, that this is when he picked up this information. This is when he first spoke to Peter and James. He, he, he himself got converted, but didn't go to Jerusalem and see the apostles for three years. So what does this mean? Well, Paul was converted, likely if Jesus died in AD 33, Paul was converted around that year. So Paul then wrote down 1 Corinthians in AD 55, but he got this creed within the first three years after he was baptized. Um, so we're looking at around it sometime around AD 36. But what that means is this creed was going around within a year or two after Jesus died. So it wasn't a late legend that was developed re after this. But this oral tradition confirms again this idea that the apostles claim to have seen the risen Christ. And the date of it indicates that they were claiming this from the very start. It wasn't a late legend added later. So the third bit of evidence to back up this idea that they claimed it is the written works themselves of the Gospels and also the early church fathers. So Clement, who was a bishop of Rome, AD 30 to 100, he wrote a uh, letter to the church in Corinth around AD 95 saying that the apostles had claimed to have seen the risen Christ. Polycarp, AD 69 to 155, was a bishop of the church of Smyrna. He also wrote about the apostles claiming this as well. I just basically saying the idea that the disciples claim to have seen the risen Jesus. So that's just three bits of evidence which support the idea that the apostles had claimed to have seen the risen Jesus. Paul's writings, um, the early creeds, and also the, the Gospels and the other early church fathers all supported this idea that they claimed it. And again, it's backed up by atheist New Testament scholars as well. Second thing we want to look at with this the disciples believe he rose and appeared to them was the idea that well they claimed it but did they believe it so they could have just claimed it but does that actually mean that they believed it is it possible they just wanted to to, believe, to claim it because it fit it with what they were were preaching at the time well how do we know they believed it well very strong evidence it teaches us that they were willing to suffer uh, because they went through a radical transformation they were steadfast in the face of imprisonment torture and death the strength of their conviction to suffer this way shows that they didn't just claim it, but they actually believed it. Compare this to their character, the, 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 the arrest of Jesus. Compare this to the difference. They, they ran away from Jesus. They, they were abandoned him. They hid in fear. And yet, such a radical transformation in such a short period of time that they actually put themselves in danger. This martyrdom, as we know, 11 of the 12 apostles were martyred, and with John being willing to be martyred, none of them recanted is confirmed by many people as confirmed in the book of acts obviously that look wrote confirmed by clement of rome polycarp ignatius dionysius of corinth tertullian and oregon all these early church fathers also supported this idea that they were martyred um, and also some non-christian sources support this as well such as josephus um, now what does this mean these extreme acts don't validate the truth of their beliefs but they do confirm their willingness to die indicates they regarded their beliefs as true. So their willingness to die and suffer, they regarded these claims at, to be true. Uh, there's an important difference to note here between apostles and modern martyrs though, because you can automatically think, well, yeah, but other martyrs sincerely believe something, but they're wrong and they die for their beliefs as well. There's a big difference. Modern martyrs trust beliefs that other people have passed on to them. So they trust secondary source information that's been passed on to them. The apostles died willingly and without recanting because of their own testimony, because they claim to have seen the risen Jesus. Contemporary martyrs die because of what others say is true. The apostles die because of what they claim to have seen to be true. So it's primary source evidence versus secondary source evidence here. 
Um, Jared Lumen, an atheist New Testament scholar, said it may be mistaken as historically certain that Peter and his disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as a risen Christ. There's many New Testament scholars who are not believers, not Christians, atheists, believe it or not, who support the very evidence I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you right now. So that's the, the first bit of evidence, which is Jesus' disciples claimed that Jesus appeared to them risen from the dead, and they also believed it, shown by their life. Second bit of evidence that we'll look at is just the empty tomb. So I'm going to go on that there's four pieces of evidence that support the empty tomb. We've probably heard about the empty tomb before. Um, so four bits of evidence on the early tomb. The first bit, the early evidence of the earliest known creed that we've already looked at in 1 Corinthians 15, um, the significance of the deity supports the empty tomb because it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he was buried and was raised on the third day. The significance of this is the deity. As I said, Paul wrote in the mid-50s, uh, but Bart Ehrman, again, one of the New Testament critics, it doesn't, not a Christian anymore, supports that Paul received this from Peter, uh, talked about, as we looked at already, in Galatians 1, 18, and it, this, receiving this from Peter would have been around the mid-30s, AD. So two years, within two years of the death of Jesus. So um, within three years, the creed then affirms Jesus' bodily resurrection, which also means there had to have been an empty tomb. So that's the first bit of evidence on the empty tomb. The earliest known creed supports that that's what they that's that the tomb was empty. It couldn't have been circulated if the tomb wasn't empty, and that it wasn't a late legend. The second bit of evidence on the empty tomb then would be the idea that Jesus' body was buried in Jerusalem. How does that help us out? Well, this helps us because it indicates where Christianity started from, Jerusalem. The disciples preached that Jesus is risen from the dead, but they preached this in Jerusalem, the very place where Jesus w was buried. They preached in the same city that he was crucified and buried, yet the movement flourished despite opposition. So we know how the Romans and the Jews felt towards the Christians at this time. It would have been so easy for them to crush this movement, to go to the tomb and pull out the body. It would have been so easy for them to do this in order to suppress this movement. But the body was never produced. And there was never any counter stories given against what the apostles were preaching in the city of Jerusalem. So they could not have continued to preach in this city had the tomb not been empty. So this again supports the theory of the empty tomb, which again most scholars also support. So that's the first one. I'm just keeping a check on all these. Um, early creed supports the empty tomb. The body been buried in Jerusalem supports the empty tomb. The third bit, I'm sure you've heard this, the tomb was first discovered empty by women. Mark 16, 1 to 8, you can read 1 to 18, you can read that the tomb was discovered by Mary and other women, they were the first witnesses. Now, to appreciate how significant this is, you need to see how women are viewed in first century Palestine. Um, it was said by Josephus in Antiquities 4, 8, 15, but let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and the boldness of their sex, since it is probable that they may not speak truth either out of hope of gain or fear of punishment. Women, surprising as it is to say, and unfortunately fortunately things have moved on since then, women were not considerable, considered credible witnesses due to being intellectually and morally deficient at that particular time in first century Palestine. Why would the gospel writers designate them as the first witnesses, given that their witness that they had would not be taken seriously? Why would they do this? If they were looking to substantiate a false story that their tomb was empty when it wasn't, or they'd seen the risen Christ when they didn't, they would have listed Peter and John, reputable pillars of the church, as the first witnesses of the resurrection. They could easily have done that, but they didn't. And you think, well, why put women as the first witnesses? Well, it's because that's what happened. It's because that was the truth, and they had to detail the stories as they actually happened. This embarrassment, women being the first witnesses to the risen Jesus, is one standard historians gauge to, to gauge the truthfulness, historicity of an event. Is there embarrassing details in there? Well, it's unlikely they're making it up. If you wanted to make up a story about your own life, that you wanted to fabricate something to be true, you would not add in embarrassing details that make you look worse. And if they're in there, again, it authenticates the story. So to include embarrassing details women, about women witnesses to the empty tomb, it authenticates the details of the story. So the last bit then we have is that Jew, the Jews claimed the disciples had stolen the body. Another evidence that points to the tomb being empty. That's it. You'll find that in Matthew 28, 11 to 15. Um, let's actually look there quickly for a second. Matthew 28, 11 to 15. It tells us 
While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised the plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. So this was the story concocted by the Jews. Um, why would the Jews circulate this type of story if the tomb wasn't empty? Now you think, well, this is in the scriptures, this is then. Did that story die out? It actually didn't die out. And Justin Martyr talks about the Jews holding to this belief, even in the second century. It's supported also by Tertullian. They confirm that it was still circulating in their day. Well, the disciples had stolen his body. Some Jews had believed this. The Jews claim, presupposes that the body was missing, that there was no body and the tomb was, in fact, empty. Amen. Historical evidence of the highest quality because it comes from enemies of the early Christian faith. They would not want to put in details to support this outlandish theory in their mind that Jesus had risen from the dead. It's clear from the evidence that Jesus' tomb was found empty three days after, the cruci after his crucifixion by a group of women followers. And it was said, um, New Testament critics have said this, it's extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. They don't want to believe. They can't believe. They don't open their mind up to the actual evidence that is there. Jacob Kramer says, By far, most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of biblical statements about the empty tomb. Many surveys have been done which have found it. Over 75% of scholars since 1975, Gary Habermas did a study, have found that they accept the historicity and discovery of Jesus' empty tomb. So just a little summary on that. We looked at two things today. Jesus' disciples believed, believed he rose and appeared to them. That's the first thing. They claimed it, but they also believed it. Seen by the, the, the story of, their, of how, how they finished and how they were martyred. And the second thing is the empty tomb. Supported by four pieces of evidence here, although there are more. The early creed that we want to look at again, if you want to look at that, 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus' body was buried in Jerusalem. The tomb was first discovered empty by women. Again, not credible witnesses. And the, the Jews claimed that the disciples had stolen the body. That's a very quick look into some of the evidences there that was only two of five that i looked at they also the other evidences where jesus was crucified and um, that was supported it's not a legend uh, paul and also james so there's other bits of evidences please look into these a bit more if you can if you get time but it's been a pleasure to share some of this with you today please let me know your thoughts on my channel my bible guy but thanks so much for listening to me and i'll hopefully see you all again soon thank you so much simon there's a lot there for us to think about and i think it will help our faith and it will help us to be resourced to help other people. So a couple of questions you could be discussing in a family group or a household unit. Firstly, what from the things that Simon shared, what, what helped you in your faith? What refreshed your own faith, your own confidence in the resurrection? And secondly, how has what Simon shared better equipped you to be able to go and talk to other people about the reality of the resurrection what was most useful to you in perhaps sharing with other people and maybe a third question might be who who do you know who you could have a conversation about this with that might help them maybe they're not the sneering type hopefully they're not perhaps they are the curious type and that's that's all we're looking for is to help the curious and being better equipped to help the curious well is a good thing so that's uh, what we have this week. Next week, next in two weeks' time, it'll be Rob Payne. I look forward to that. And by the way, last last thing, if you get a chance, I would thoroughly recommend that you check out the rest of Simon Dinning's work. Look him up on YouTube, That Bible Guy. Look him up there and, you'll, and subscribe to his channel and you'll find lots of useful materials that might help you, your children, your friends, anybody who, who wants to have more evidences for having faith in the Christian message. Thank you, Simon, again. I really appreciate you doing this in your spare time for us. I'm very grateful. So until the next time, take care and God bless.